missing Sarah again this morning. Um, you guys know me well enough to know that I'm not a sports person, um, but if you have had any conversation with me at all, I can almost guarantee I have referenced a podcast that I listened to. Um, one of the benefits of my second job is that I have uh, a lot of time to work with my hands, but in an environment where it's okay for me to have something in my ears. And so I have, over the last seven years, probably listened to more podcasts than anybody really should. Um, and so you know I'm not a sports person, but I have listened to a couple of podcasts. And so I, I give you a sports analogy, not because I know it, but because I heard somebody talk about it. That makes me an expert, right? <clears throat> so this came from a podcast that I haven't listened to a ton, um, but it was recommended by a different one that I listen to kind of regularly. And so I listened to one or two episodes. And it's called The Happiness Lab. And the whole premise of the show is this is a psychologist, a doctor person who's looking at um, happiness and how do people get happy and what makes us unhappy and where can we find peace and, and joy and contentment in this broken world. Um, it's funny how they always come up just short of answering that question, but that's what they're trying to do. Um, and so one of the things that I thought was interesting, imagine for yourself an Olympic podium. Gold, silver, and, and bronze medals are being awarded. There are three top athletes, the three best athletes in the world of their sport. There are three of them, and one of them is furious almost every time. One of them is the most unhappy person that is on that platform. Who do you think it is? All right, bronze. I heard bronze. So you've got this, the person who's like competed and like they got, they didn't quite do whatever, but they're like, they got third. And so that would be frustrating. I heard somebody say silver. It actually is the silver. So nobody thinks it's the gold. The gold is like, yes, I have achieved my thing. Like I, I've trained all this time. I put all this effort into it. And now I am, I've got the gold medal. I am the best athlete at my sport. The person in third place is just thankful to have made it to the podium. They can smell fourth place. They're thinking, man, I, if I had done just a little bit worse, then maybe I wouldn't have even got, and I'm just glad to be here. I'm thankful, like, I'll get another turn maybe, I'll get another opportunity, but, and today wasn't my day to get gold, but nobody's shooting for silver, ever. And the person who got the silver medal is not thinking about how they could have been in third. They're thinking about how they could have been in the first place. They're fixated on what just escaped their grasp. They're not thankful for the position that they've gotten. This is, you know, I'm sure there are some great silver medalists that have done this with dignity. But their gut reaction in fallen humanity is, is like, I just missed it! Ah! And they're fixated on what they miss, not on what they've got. Um, and so that's the happiness lab. I think that that's interesting, especially as we consider our text this morning and how we journey together. Because if we're journeying together and, and what we're looking for, similar to the happiness lab, what we're looking for is true strength in the midst of twisted times. Like I think we're all on the same page that these times are a little bit backwards, They're a little bit upside down, everything feels a little bit tweaked. Um, and so where do we find strength in those times? And as we turn to Philippians, the end of Philippians chapter 1, we're going to finish chapter 1 and move into chapter 2 today. But what he's going to encourage us to do is something that we don't want to do. He's going to encourage us to take the silver medal on purpose. And everything in us is going to fight against that. So, just giving you a heads up, this one's going to be kind of difficult, but I think you guys can hang with me. Um, before we turn there, let's pause together and pray. And I like to begin, for a number of reasons, our, our teaching time, our pr time of prayer, uh, by doing the disciples' prayer together. These aren't magic words. They don't endow you with any spiritual blessings just for saying them. If you say them a certain number of times, that doesn't give you more blessings. This is just the model of prayer that Jesus left for his disciples. Um, and it's helpful if we're praying it together to pray the same words. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power. Amen. 
If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 27. And if you're using the Blue Bibles, it's on page 1222, 1222, 1222 in the Blue Bibles. Those are going to be under your chair and the chair in front of you. Or navigate to Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. And actually, as we start here, I think I'm just going to look at that, that verse. We're just going to start with verse 27 this morning. He writes, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So we'll we'll pause there. So we're jumping into the middle of a letter. We're jumping into um, the middle of an idea, and it's a letter that wasn't written to us. It was written to somebody else. So this is Paul the Apostle, who started this church in a city called Philippi. It was the first church to, that, was not, um, that didn't have a Jewish background that, that turned to Christ. And so Paul has a really special relationship with these people. He was kind of their founding pastor and has spent a number of years away from them. But now they're here. They have received word from one of their, um, they've sent a messenger to let Paul know, we heard you're in jail and we want to help you out. And he's sending the messenger back and giving them this report. And he's said, look, like, I'm in prison, yeah, but don't don't remember last week that I don't know how this is going to turn out. To live is Christ, to die is gain. And so for your sake, I hope that I live. I hope that I make it through this. But if I don't, like, yeah, that's that's okay for me too. Um, And he's saying that he's he's convinced that he's going to stay and he's convinced that he's going to continue to pour into them. And so if I am in these chains and if I am going to be released from these chains and I'm going to continue to walk in this life, what do I want for you to do? In verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So this founding pastor, far away from this congregation, is saying, hey, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. So what is the gospel? <laughs> what is the gospel and how does our manner of life like, act worthy of it? Does that mean that we've got to be really good Christians, that we, we can't swear anymore or we can't, like, we, we've got to stop doing all of that stuff that we're not supposed to do? Like, what, what does it mean to walk worthy uh, or to live in a manner worthy of the gospel? Well, I think it's important to, to identify first what the gospel is. The gospel uh, it comes from a Greek word that just means proclamation of good news. So if there had been an army far, far away that had won a battle, they would send a messenger throughout town, because this is before the internet happened, Um, They would have to send an actual guy to walk around and tell people, hey, we won that battle over there. And that guy was a messenger of the gospel. He brought the good news that we won the battle. And so the people are not necessarily having to put up ramparts and defenses around their cities. They're saying, okay, that battle got won. Like, things are going to be okay for a couple more weeks. Like, we're we're okay. We're We're still under peace. The gospel is the same thing. It's the good news that Jesus went to the cross and died, that he won the victory over sin and over death. It's that Jesus was died, he was buried, he was resurrected, and he promises that he's coming back. That is the good news. It's as simple as that. And so if you, how do we let our manner of life be worthy of that good news? If, if the gospel in a, in a secular sense, in a worldly sense, was like, okay, I don't have to put up defenses around my city, I don't have to sleep with my pistol under my, my pillow, like, the, the invading army's probably not coming through here, right? That's, that's the takeaway from the gospel if it's an army. Maybe walking a lot, letting our manner of life be worthy of the gospel is saying, look, like, I'm not, like, 
trying to put up all, I'm not trying to put up all these defenses. I'm not trying to make everybody believe that I'm a good person. I just am following Jesus. I'm trusting him. He says that he won the victory over my sin. And some days I feel like it, he hasn't. I, some days I feel like that was a false claim. Some days I'm looking at my sin going like, that's pretty strong. I don't know that I can, I can handle that. Like I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to sin. And so what do I do in those moments? Do I trust Christ? And say, no, he won. I'm not a slave to this thing that's calling me to it. The victory is won. And I live in light of the fact that I am forgiven. My sins have been forgiven. Um, We studied, and this was back right at the beginning of COVID, so I don't know that we'll necessarily remember. But in in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus tells the story of a servant who had been forgiven a great debt and then turns around and goes to other people that owed him money and puts them in prison and beats them up and makes sure that he can get his money back. He says, no, no, no. If you were forgiven, then that means you should also treat others as though they should be forgiven. If, if you are looking at other people's, um, if you're looking at what other people owe you when you have been forgiven, then maybe you haven't quite understood how much your debt was. And that's challenging to us. Like, that's a reason why I think Jesus left for us in the model um, that we should be praying, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgiveness is key. If we are a forgiven people, then we are a forgiving people. And do you know what that means? You can't be a forgiving people without people to forgive. And you can't be a forgiving people without people who have done something needing forgiveness. It's real, real easy to be a forgiving person if I don't ever see anybody. (laughs) If nobody ever gets in my business or says anything really dumb at the grocery store, if nobody pulls out of me in traffic, I'm a really forgiving person. As long as everybody just leaves me alone. But if Jesus' expectation is that I am going to be a forgiving person, that means he expects me to be involved with people who are going to need forgiveness. I sure wish, like, I don't know if you say this sometimes, like, work would be great if it weren't for all the people, (laughs) you know? And I feel like that's true about a number of different things. My family would be great if not for all the people in it, right? Be so easy. Following Jesus is a team sport. There's something that he does inside me as an individual, but what he does inside me as an individual puts me on his team. And he invites me to participate as though I belong to that family instead. And kindness toward and unity with other people requires confidence in Jesus. I can't forgive you for what you did against me unless I acknowledge that I have sinned greater against Christ, and he has been willing to forgive me. Does Jesus, like, does, that's our our big idea for the morning. I'll go there first. Trusting Jesus reorders our priorities in our relationships. If I'm, if I'm going to trust Jesus, then it's going to reorder what the priorities are in all of my relationships. Sometimes I think, when I hear the idea, only let your life or let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, I think that that means like a personal righteousness. I personally am not doing sin. I personally am um, walking fruitfully. I like have my own little halo over here, right? Like I'm not doing the bad things. Um, but this is an interesting concept that I think sometimes we miss. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, which either is a possibility, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. What do you mean? What do you mean how I walk with Jesus? If I am walking with Jesus, I don't walk alone. 
oh, I think we had a big idea a couple of weeks ago. No one can follow Jesus alone. And how I walk with Jesus is reflected in how I walk with my brothers and sisters in him. So, our personal faith. Does our manner of life with Jesus show up in our life with other people? Does our manner of life with Jesus and, and, and interacting with him and the forgiveness that we receive from him, the new life that he has put within us, does that show up in how I interact with the most difficult people at work or the people in traffic or the people in my family? Does our manner of life with Jesus show up in our life with other people? Because trusting Jesus reorders the priorities in our relationships. So let's, let's continue reading a little bit. With one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, verse 28, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God, for it has been granted to you <clears throat> that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. We'll pause there. There's a, um, a public relations concept here that I think we'd be, we would be good, yeah, it would be good for us to notice in the age of social media. Is let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you. There's a sense in which there's times where we want people to believe certain things about us, and so we tell them to believe those certain things about us. This is easy, easy, easy on social media. I only take pictures of my kids when they're smiling. But let me tell you what, if I posted all the times, that, all the tears that we had in our house, like throughout the week, maybe even just this morning, you'd be like, man, that guy's a wreck. Like, I don't, I don't, know, if, I don't know if I like him so much. Like, <clears throat> We, we, we get to say what we put out there. We get to say what shows up on social media. Like, that's why most of my pictures are of flowers, because nobody gets angry at flowers, right? Like, it's just kind of a happy thing, right? But y'all know that that's not everything that's going on in my life. And as we walk together, like, the people who know me know me well, and they know what's going on. They don't need, they're like, oh, Michael's posting more about flowers. All right, okay, great. <clears throat> But what matters is who you are, not who you say you are. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. If your manner of life is worthy of the gospel, you don't have to say, my manner of life is worthy of the gospel. It just is. And your, your PR, the things that people hear about you, are good things. Whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I'll hear about you. And, and you're not frightened in anything by your opponents. And this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God, which is granted to you for the sake of Christ, that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So the people in Philippi had a really, uh, really clear, like the lines were drawn really clearly in their town. There were people that had followed Jesus through Paul, and there were people who had beat Paul and put him in prison. Clearly opponents. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not a sports guy, but you can imagine being in conflict, uh, being in a game, and at the end of the game, the smell, <laughs> right? The sweat, maybe a little bit of blood, like the dirt. There's a, there's a fragrance to having put in a lot of effort to win a game. Um, we read from, from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, that we are the fragrance of Christ, and that smell of Christ is life to those who believe and death, the fragrance of death, to those who don't believe. If I won that game, that sweat and that dirt, that fragrance that I smell is like, this is the smell of victory! Like, we worked hard! Like, I feel good! Um, I'm trying to think of what I've seen on... I've got some power lifter friends. They've got sayings on their mugs all the time about sweat and gain and all, I don't know what they do. It's all bogus. They don't believe them anyway. Um, but it's that kind of an idea. But if you lost, you, I just want to take a shower. I'm dirty. I'm stinky. Like I don't. The smell. I don't like it. 
the smell of defeat. Um, in the Roman world, this was a different kind of a picture. Actually, if, if, an inv- if an army had gone off and defeated an enemy and won the war, they would bring captives back and they would have a parade through the town to show, like, these are who we just conquered, and we've got them all in chains, and see, they're not a danger to us anymore. And part of that was burning incense in the parade. Like, they'd be throwing candy or throwing coins or whatever, and they would light this incense. And that incense, as it goes through the town, is the incense, the fragrance of victory. We've conquered this people. And so as the people in the town smell that fragrance, they know, like, we won the battle. Like, this is good news. It's the fragrance of life for those who have won, and it's the fragrance of death for the, slave, for the captives in the back who are on their way to their execution. Not frightened in anything by your opponents, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. What is? That you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Unity. That the church is unified. That the church is centered on Jesus is a sign that God's doing something. Right? Like, we're all on the same page. Like, we all know how difficult people can be. If, if you've got a group of people from different backgrounds and different socioeconomic statuses and different histories and different ethnicities, if you've got all of those people that are coming together around one thing and they're flying the same banner, you've got to know there's something divine happening in that room because people don't get along naturally, do they? And the unity of the body of Christ is a sign of their destruction to those who are opposed to him. We can't stop this. This is from God. But remember, we cannot be a forgiving people if we don't have others to forgive that are needing forgiveness, right? It has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him. That's what I got growing up in a Southern Baptist church growing up. Believe in Christ, believe in Christ, believe in Christ. Like, I got that. Like, okay, I believe. I got it. Like, I I got the doctrinal statement down. I get it. Jesus Christ, Lord of all. Like, Lord of my life. I can, I bought onto that train that you should believe in Christ, not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. To forgive the one who spoke out of turn. To extend kindness to the person that you feel like stabbed you in the back. Some of the worst wounds I have sustained have been from brothers and sisters in Christ in church. Some of my darkest seasons of depression and spiritual conflict of physical illness because of spiritual conflict have been because of conflicts within the church and people who should have known better. And I'm sorry because I suspect that that's been your experience too on occasion. But Christ has made us a forgiving people. And as we cling to him, as we come together in spite of ourselves and around Jesus and the forgiveness that he's extended to us, that unity is the fragrance in the world. The fragrance of life to those of us who believe God is doing something in the world. And it's the fragrance of death to those who are opposed to it. Cool, Michael, that's like some theology. I kind of kind of get it. Like, I'm kind of bought on. All right, unity, we got to get along. Great. Like, is this the 60s? Do we need some daisies on our van? Like, what's going on here? How do I do that? What, what does that even look like? Like, you've hinted at it, and you've told me that it's going to be hard. You've even equated it to suffering. But what does it actually look like if trusting Jesus reorders the priorities in our relationships and my priorities need to be unity, then how do I, how do I, how do I do that? Chapter 2, verse 1. 
So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. That's more of the same, right? But here's the how. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This is the how-to. Take the second place on purpose. I love how he starts this chapter. If there's any encouragement in Christ, is, is there any encouragement in Christ? When I think about Jesus Christ, like Lord and creator of all the world, like stepping down into, the, into human history and, and putting on flesh and going to the cross and extending forgiveness and grace and kindness for all the ways that I screw up every day, like... <sighs> I, yeah, there's a little bit of encouragement in that, that I can be forgiven and be right. Like, if there's any encouragement in Christ, maybe I can find something to be encouraged by. If there's any comfort from love, have you, this has been part of the reason why some of this pandemic has been so difficult, because we've been separated from people who love us, and, and even when we're together, like, we're, we're covered up, and so, like, we want the comfort and the affection from, from being around people who love us. If there's any comfort from love, if there's any participation in the Spirit, have you ever been in those moments where you're saying things, and you go, these are not my words, I don't know how I'm saying these things, like, this must be the Spirit speaking through me. <clears throat> if there's any affection and sympathy then complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. If there's anything at all good in the message of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we ought to work together. We ought to be unified. But how? Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Trusting Jesus reorders the priorities in our relationships. I pulled this picture out um, because I thought it was a construction crew, and I had never seen a construction crew that everybody got the same T-shirt. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Like, everybody's got the same T-shirt. They all seem to be wearing it. And the more I looked at it, the more I realized I've seen this before. Uh, we lived in Indiana for a time. Um, and Indiana is home to large sections of community that are Amish. These guys aren't all on the same team. <laughs> they just all happen to wear the same thing all the time anyway. <laughs> uh, this is an Amish barn raising. These, there's a guy in their community that needs to put a barn up. And so there's... The picture actually broadens out. There's probably 100 dudes working on this barn at the same time. So where there wasn't a barn yesterday, there will be one tomorrow. And they're just working together on it. And they may or may not know the guy, Jedediah, or whatever his name is, that they're putting the barn up for. But they know, hey, he's a brother. He's part of our community. He's somebody that we're going to help. And, like, sure, there's 100 other things I could be doing with my day, but I'm going to go help Jed put his barn up. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. The way that my life goes, the way that my week spins out, is pretty easy for me to get focused in on the things that I need to do and to get focused on things that are of interest to me. And yet, living in a, letting my manner of life, my habits, 
the rhythms of how I do things be worthy of the gospel means that I'm not only considering the goals that I want to accomplish with my day, but also how I can help others accomplish their goals. How I can look to their interests, not only to my own. How I can, in humility, count others as more significant than myself. The hard thing about humility is as soon as you like put a name on it, it escapes you, right? Moses is the only one who ever got away with writing down he was the most humble guy ever. I'm not really sure how God let him off with that one, but he wrote it, so there we go. <clears throat> as soon as you say, man, I'm, I'm really humble today, like you've lost it. It's something that the Spirit does, and it happens, and you might realize it later. Oh, like, that was humility. Like, cool, <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> Count others more significant than yourselves. This isn't, I think it's C.S. Lewis. I'm probably quoting incorrectly. Somebody said at one point, humility is not thinking of yourself less. Well, I'm not going to say it because I can't remember how it goes. Not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It's not because you're, you don't have inherent quality. It's not because you're not valuable to God. It's not because your goals are not important. But it's because there are other people to invest in who have the same inherent value and that God wants to work in as well. And the funny thing about Jesus is he chooses to work through us now. More often than not, Jesus chooses to work through us. Infinite God of the universe could heal anybody, but sometimes he's waiting for you to pray for them before he heals them. Knows everything that's going on in the world and in your life, but sometimes waits until you ask him to do something. And so I can think of a thousand different ways to apply this text. It comes up a lot in my mind. And I think we'll get even more clarity on it as if the Lord permits us to go through the next section of text next week as we see some more of the foundation and basis of this. But will we consider how our choices affect others? And would we consider that maybe how it affects others is enough to make a different choice. Because trusting Jesus reorders the priorities in all of our relationships. Jesus, we need you. We don't take the second chair willingly very often. You know how deeply rooted our pride and our arrogance is. And so God, to overcome it, to root it out, it's not something that we can do by ourselves. Do you say you have conquered sin and death and you've conquered our pride and so, Lord, we're not a slave to that and we hear clearly your word to consider others more than ourselves. So Jesus, would you be doing your work in us? Would you help our manner of life, our patterns, our habits, the rhythm of how we go through our week reflect the good news that we have been forgiven and we have a hope for the future? an eternal hope. Jesus, you're our hope in life and death. So we pray as long as we are living that you'd be working in us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.